Thank you so much for the support you gave me, guys. Okay. Today, I got promoted. Those who spread goodness radiate happiness to everyone around them. Introducing LOLC Finance Credit Cards. Fuel the goodness in you. Welcome to LMD TV. This week on Talking Business, Anushan Silvaraja speaks with Shanika Ratnayaka, CEO of the Great Places to Work Institute in Sri Lanka. Welcome to the show, Shanika. Good to have you with us. Good, uh, good evening, Anushan. Nice to be with uh, you on this program. Shanika, what is behind the philosophy of a great place to work for all? Yes, so uh, to start with, we say that, you know, basically um, any organization can become a great workplace, right? And that uh, building a great workplace is really a journey uh, and not a destination. But having said that, our philosophy is that an organization needs to create a great workplace for all, meaning for all its employees, as opposed to just a C-level or the leadership team or a particular demography, right? So we say a great workplace is characterized by what is termed as high trust, high performance culture, which I mentioned before as well. And thereby a great workplace for all, uh, you are able to maximize the human potential. That means the human capital that you have in the organization through uh, what we look at as effective leaders, meaning few values, and a deep-rooted foundation of trust with all employees, regardless of who they are and what they do in the company. And when these are in place, these factors are, you know, uh, balancing forces are in place, we say the workplace benefits or an outcome is of improved innovation by all, everybody contributing towards, you know, continuous improvement and those aspects within the organization resulting in, of course, financial growth, which is what uh, everybody is looking for or which, which is really the outcome that people are looking to connect to. Is there a direct cause and effect or correlation between uh, workplace culture and performance? Yes, so our research, research sorry, has shown that there is a strong relationship or correlation between the two, right? Great workplaces, uh, we have observed, that organizations that are recognized as best workplaces outperform others in uh, the stock markets or the market indices by as much as three to four times, right? And this is backed by independent research that has been conducted both by uh, Russell's investment group in uh, the USA and uh, RMSI in India that confirm our position as a high trust, high performing uh, workplace, right? So workplace culture, meaning that they are able to show that great workplaces have actually outperformed uh, other organizations in the stock markets by as much as three times in the US and as much as four times uh, back home, uh, closer to home uh, in India, right? Another demonstration really is that uh, if you take the level of attrition, right? Best workplaces have been seen to experience a much lower, as much as 50 to 65% less turnover in these organizations, right? And global data supports this correlation. There's an important correlation between what we call trust levels and reduced costs that uh, organizations are experiencing. Research also tells us that um, it costs as much as three times more to hire somebody or replace an employee than uh, it costs to retain one, right? So these are only just two financial indicators that tell us that, you know, uh, the two, uh, there, there is a correlation or there is cause and effect, right? But there's also other aspects of evidence. Um, you talk of improved productivity, right? Through innovation and agility and the higher caliber of human capital that we are hiring and retaining as well as uh, the levels of quality of the products and services that these organizations are producing on the one hand, right? And on the other, we talk of reduced absenteeism or reduction in healthcare costs because you have a much a healthier uh, workforce, um, and also uh, less likely uh, to have resistance to change because you have an open culture uh, that is also engaging in innovative ideas in these organizations. And all of this, of course, adds up to increase customer loyal loyalty and profitability, once again, which is what measured and tell us whether an organization is performing or not, right? So, Finally, apart from the financial indicators and the not so financial, but the softer ones that we can actually measure in terms of rupees and cents, there are also some key health indicators uh, related to culture, which we look at. Um, and we see that where you have a high performing culture, the levels of motivation, uh, discretionary effort, and of course, advocacy, 
right? All of um, these are very high in high trust environments, contributing to that high performing culture within the organization. So yes, I mean, the answer is really that we have both research and uh, facts that tell us that there is a correlation between high performance and high culture. Shanika, what uh, bits and pieces or, or components would you say are needed to build a great workplace culture? Right. So, I mean, great workplaces are created, we say, by people, right? So great leaders. Um, and then, of course, uh, you need um, a management team that executes um, this environment that is created uh, by great leaders. You know, that whole thought process gets converted. And then you need people uh, working in the organization, or we, we refer to them as all the employees in the organization who are playing their role to sustain uh, this environment that is being created or the culture that is being created, uh, thought out and implemented by managers, right? So uh, basically creating great workplaces require that the organization focus on setting up um, great uh, people practices, as we call them, right? This is what defines the culture within the organization, the practices, the processes, the procedures that you roll out day to day. And then ensuring that these translate into a great uh, employee experience, right? So when we talk of great practices, these impact employee perception, right? In terms of things like their belief on whether management is credible, uh, whether they feel respected as individuals, and of all of these create um, what we term as a fair work environment. Everybody is looking to see whether there's fairness in the work environment, right? So this is what creates the sense of this is a fair working environment for each one of us, right? And on the other hand, great workplaces also infuse a great sense of pride in people working in the organization. And that enhances the competitive image while ensuring that employees enjoy a very high level of camaraderie or camaraderie as in the context of teamwork, how well they work together with other people in the organization towards uh, common goals and achieving uh, the objectives of the overall organization. So that is why we say these aspects are the three most important. So leadership that uh, drives it from great leaders who drive it from the top and managers who will execute these through the practices that are being put in place and employees who live the values and practices and sustain the culture that is being created within the organization. Now, you mentioned about retaining employees and maintaining an open culture, a workplace culture, but here in Sri Lanka, there is another issue. Uh, it's all about, in about inclusivity, where uh, there are people who should be working but don't get those opportunities uh, because of their either their gender or their sexuality or other such uh, differences, archaic as they may be. Uh, shouldn't this be looked into when uh, trying to uh, maintain or create an open and a great workplace culture? Most definitely, I 100% agree with you, Anushan. And uh, actually, I, I want to also clarify there, when people look at um, uh, inclusiveness, right? A lot of the time, people misunderstand and say, okay, if you have a gender balance, then you, ha you have an inclusive uh, uh, organization or society or culture, as the case may be. Uh, but it's a lot more than just gender balance, right? So we're talking about creating an inclusive culture in terms of, yes, gender, of course, uh, but also in terms of all the different um, types of, you know, whether it's sexual orientation, it's where you come from, which kind of education background you have, uh, whether you have, you know, with, with your differently abled or whether your, your whole thinking mechanism, right? It could be, it could also be uh, age, different, different age groups, but it also could be your whole ideation process, the way you think, the way you behave is very different. And organizations need this, right? Because if you have only all like-minded in any situation, right? Whether it's a cricket team, right? If you have only batsmen in your cricket team, right? You're going to go out there and put up 500, you know, runs, and then you cannot get the other side out. So, you know, the other side is probably going to, you know, continue to bat anyway, even if they don't have a, mix, a, a very deep batting order, right? Um, so you really need a mix and match of people with their skill set to where they come from, what is it that they are doing, uh, the gender balance. And, and that is something that we encourage and also something that we look at when we are creating this sense of great place to work for all, right? So we are saying it is not for you know, a particular boys club or a particular school, or it is not for uh, uh, a particular race or caste, as the case may be, right? We, we, we battle on all these grounds, right? So it should be that 
we are able to pull the talent in and attract people from all these different backgrounds and then the culture in the organization is such that you are able to pick from these diverse uh, backgrounds the talent right mm-hmm. hone and nurture um, their capability and then we talk about this maximizing human potential so to do that we have to have a mechanism in place that enables organizations to get the best out of their talent right by making us making sure also that you have um, a good variety of talent through uh, diversity and inclusion as uh, we term it dni yeah we're going for a short break now our story is one of reimagining reimagining who you can be what you can achieve and how sema can support you as technology and digital platforms disrupt businesses we are reimagining what the profession can be We've updated our syllabus to meet the expectation of employers, ensuring SEMA qualified professionals have the skills to make an impact from day one. Reimagine your career. Contact SEMA Sri Lanka. Welcome back to the show as we continue our discussion with the CEO of the Great Places to Work Institute of Sri Lanka, Shanika Ratnayagar. Shanika, let's go back to those components we were talking about before the break. Now, how can these be tweaked uh, to ensure effective changes in workplace culture? Right. So, creating a great workplace, we say, is essentially, if you were to simplify it, a three-step approach. Right. There's nothing simple about it, but nevertheless, I mean, there's a very simple approach to it. First and foremost, we believe that management intent and vision. Right. Like in anything, somebody. at the top for somebody who really matters needs to have a vision or an interest in creating that right culture right the second aspect uh, is basically once there is intent is putting in place what we call those great practices to support that intent or vision right for example you have a vision right um, you want to do something unless you set in place set into motion certain actions right or strategies and initiatives uh, in order to achieve that Uh, it's not just going to happen uh, when you wake up the next day, right? Or over a period of time, there's some activities that need to take place, and this is what we call putting in sound people practices that support the intent. And then the third step is really now you have put the prat, you have the intent, you have built the practices around what culture you want to create, right? Then of course comes the execution, right? Uh, what do you do? Uh, to translate these uh, practice, practices in a way that employees in the organization are having a great experience or what how do you uh, convert these so this translation comes through the way of the way the manager behaves because at the end of the day in an organization you have a leadership team but you also have several levels layers and levels of managers uh, who people report to and that is the direct connect between the employees and the levels of management within the organization so each individual manager is responsible for ensuring that uh, everybody is having a fair and equal and good experience within the organization so it is important to ensure that all managers within that organization are behaving in a way that they are practicing what is put in place um, and they are creating that positive experience for employees and when you have those together with that deep rooted trust that we say that trusting bond between employee and management that you need to create within the organization that we talked of again at the beginning that is when you can actually create um that excellent um environment in which you are able to get the maximum of the human potential so these are the three things that we would say that you really needed to focus on in order to have effective change so you know, one of the challenges in implementing this cultural change uh, within workplaces especially in a country like sri lanka where individuals come with their own cultures so to speak uh, depending on where they've been brought up or how they've been brought up uh, baggage so to speak how does that work when you want to develop an open work culture right so primarily yes you're, you're very correct in saying that you know people bring if a bit uh, use of a better word their baggage with them right so or inherently what they've learned or what they've grown up with right so even when you hire laterally from other organizations or from other industries you find that people coming into the organization will bring their own subcultures with them what they're familiar with and what they've been in right but when you look at the main challenge i think both globally and more so locally 
um, that is faced in implementing a great workplace culture. This is more about management's intent, right? The question is whether the culture and the people interventions are viewed as uh, strategic uh, uh, to management, right? Is this important enough for it to be strategic or just as business or finance or, you know, marketing and those aspects uh, are looked at within the organization? And if so, are they actually willing to do a, do something about it? Because sometimes people say, yeah, of course, you know, culture is strategic, but they, you know, they don't put their money where their mouth is or they don't follow that up with action or initiatives that really need to tell us that they are going to take action in making sure that culture is being corrected. So the leadership or the management needs to decide what is right for them. It is not about what some other organization or some other industry is doing, right? It's not about a fad or what is, you know, uh, trending now, but it is about what is right for this uh, business or this organization. And is their intent in taking it up at a strategic level, focusing in focusing on it and investing where we need to in order to get this done. And we have been grappling with this for a long time uh, in order to get leaders to focus on this because most leaders say, ah, yes, of course, you know, everybody, we have a culture all our very own and we know it's there, but culture is soft, you know, or culture is not measurable. And it's, you know, it's just there. We don't really need to invest in it. Um, so. So this is, this is the problem, right? They are aware that uh, it is something that creates that environment for the organization, but all they say, you know, it's something we cannot change or it's something that we have inherited, right? Without taking the bull by its horns and saying, okay, we really need to get out there and do something about this. So what we are saying is, you probably heard uh, the famous quote uh, from Peter Drucker that says, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? Um, and to be clear, this is not to say that strategy is unimportant, rather that a powerful and empowering culture is a sure route for organizational success. As a final question then, what are the pros and cons of the work from home concept uh, in terms of creating a good uh, or great workplace culture when people aren't even in the workplace? It said, you know, it said it's while well, it's being good, it's also had a lot of challenges, right? People uh, also who have always wanted to work from home or wanted more flexibility or not want, not known exactly the level of flexibility uh, ex extent of it that they wanted. Um, once they had it unconditionally, meaning you know they, that was the only option available for a long, for a long time, um, don't necessarily or, or like it. Right. So that's that's uh, in hindsight, when you look back and say, oh, wow, you know, uh, it's nice to have a combination of I can come into work when I want to or work from home when I need to. Right. But I think um, the whole shift in that work culture right, and the challenges associated with that is when people went to working from home, there were two key things that came up um, that we needed to do more of. Right. And um, in my opinion, the first one is uh, being uh, deeply connected with your employees, right? The level of connection uh, to your employees um, became more intense. You needed to actually connect uh, more because you didn't have that, you know, I see you there in office, I can see from your face whether you're having a good day. So suddenly, you know, there is, there is this big um, worldwide web uh, which allows us to connect, but uh, you don't uh, have that emotional connect, right? So the connection you needed with your employees was much at a much deeper level, right? And one way of doing this well um, was to increase communication, right? And increase the effectiveness of communication. It's not just talking for the sake of talking, right? You have to uh, do it right because otherwise um, it just becomes more, uh, you know, more information to deal with, right? So when you say communication, uh, it becomes key in any crisis situation, right? But when you say you need to speak, you need to speak to your employees and stay connected to your employees through speaking with clarity, right? Uh, in order to ensure that uh, you reassure them uh, in terms of, you know, what is it that you're doing and how is it that you're doing it? Give direction so that people are guided, right? A lot of people still need direction. Yes, you empower them and let them get on with their job, but people are also waiting for direction, right? And you also let know, let people know what is happening, right? Because while there is news and while there's social media and all of that, what they don't know is what is happening in your ecosystem, right? Or they hear it from the grapevine, which is worse. 
And the second factor is really that they feel that they are cared for, right? This caring needed to be extended to a different level altogether, right? Because people had challenges. Uh, it was not um, saying working from home is nice. Even working from home, some people didn't have the space. Some people didn't have the technology. Some people didn't have both, right? Um, and when you're working from home, you're also challenged by the fact that you have family, you have uh, home chores, you have everything to manage. And as a woman, I know, right, that um, more deeply than probably men would be, I'm, I'm not being gender biased or anything here, right? But that when, when the mother is at home or when the wife is at home, right, there's expectation naturally, right, even if they're working, uh, that there are other things that needed to be attended, like children and cooking and chores and all of that as well. So managing all of that is also challenging. So there had to be a deeper level of connecting, understanding, and caring for employees and what they were dealing with. So there is a sense of convenience. There is a con sense of uh, I can continue to work without uh, having to compromise time between my family and uh, work. Commuting, the amount of time that the commute takes, right? In Sri Lanka, we know uh, people have an average commute of one to two hours sometimes, right? And it doesn't seem useful to anybody. Uh, taking that time off, um, I, I really thought that would have some huge benefits to employees, but you find that uh, the workday became longer, but this is really going to be the new norm, I think, right? So we truly are a global village in that context. For that, I think what we need is to collaborate more with teams, right? Because you need to keep them motivated and engaged aligned with the overall business objectives, what the team is doing, how are we doing this, how do we create that connect? So more aggressive collaboration was required and listening. If there was something we needed to do much better than we were already doing, right? Uh, in order to understand what your employees are dealing with, um, you know, how can you stay connected to someone or show care if you do not understand what is it that they are dealing with day to day? Right. So you have to take feedback, listen, they could come up with new ideas of being, doing things, how do you improve their experience and how do you tailor it down to five different people, right? So you have the same set of practices, I'm not going to make it unique for you, but yes, how do you individualize it to an extent? And that is really now what our workplace is looking like. Well, that was certainly enlightening. Thank you very much for joining us on the show, Shanika. It was a great pleasure talking to Thank you. Thank you very much, Anushin, for having me. It was a pleasure indeed. And I hope we are able to get some of this message out there uh, so that business leaders uh, can look at uh, 2021 in a positive way mm -hmm. and focus on building their culture uh, in their organizations. Thank you. After a short break, Ashwini Vedakan will bring you an update on the latest LMD Nielsen Business Confidence Index. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the show, I'm Ashwini Vedakan. With the novel coronavirus persisting for nearly an year, economies the world over are looking for some form of relief courtesy of vaccines that aim to help stem the spread of the virus. Even in nations that may have thought they'd seen the back of the pandemic. On the local front, the stock market witnessed substantial interest from domestic sources and record all-time highs in the indices. And the country ended 2020 with record workers' remittances too. These milestones should be viewed in a positive light by the corporate sector. Whereas 2020 ended on a low note for the LMD Nielsen Business Confidence Index, the results of the latest survey, carried out in the first week of January, point to a welcome sense of optimism on the part of corporates as a new year dawned on a nation on edge. The BCI has turned around remarkably, skyrocketing by 39 basis points from the previous month and back into the triple digits to 122 in January, which is a notable 12 notches above the average for the last 12 months. On the other hand, the index is still a considerable distance short of the 174 points registered in January 2020. Nielsen's Director of Consumer Insight, Tharika Meenadenia, attributes this positive momentum to a renewed sense of hope, stating, The world embraced 2021 with much hope and anticipation of better things to come. 
while the New Year celebrations were subdued, anticipation of an improved 2021 was evident. Although it was a year of hardship for many, 2020 will also go down in history as the year when people learned to adapt, think out of the box and do things differently, she adds. The most pressing issues for businesses in Sri Lanka continue to be the impact of the coronavirus, followed by bribery and corruption and inflation respectively. Financial instability of businesses and consumers also emerges as a growing concern, whereas the spread of the coronavirus remains the most pressing national issue. The level of concern in relation to it has tapered somewhat vis-a-vis -vis the latest survey results alongside apprehension over the economy and bribery and corruption. And the disruption of children's education is also deemed to be a concern from a national perspective. It is noteworthy too that this edition of the BCI was compiled at a time when there were mixed messages on when Sri Lanka would roll out an immunization program. In terms of the economy, 43% of business executives consulted for the latest LMD Nielsen Business Confidence Index survey say it is likely to improve in the next 12 months. This represents a marked improvement given that only 19% of those polled back in December expressed economic optimism. Meanwhile, slightly more than 1 in 5 respondents compared to 37% in the previous month feel the economy will get worse in the 12 months ahead, whereas the remainder is of the view that conditions would remain unchanged. Both long and short-term biz prospects are likely to improve according to the latest BCI survey results. Over three quarters, up from the 47% in December of the sample, anticipate sales volumes to increase this year, while only 5% of survey participants point to flagging prospects during this time. As for the next three months, 34% versus the 14% in the prior month of those surveyed state that sales volumes will improve, although the majority 50% of respondents contend that these prospects are likely to stay the same. At least 20% of the survey sample paints the prevailing investment climate in the country in a positive light, which is an improvement from the 7% that did so in December. Nevertheless, a little over half of those spoken to by Nielsen's posters believe that this is not a good time to invest, and another 30% describe the present investment climate as being fair. Meanwhile, the shares of corporates planning to increase their workforce in the coming six months has remained more or less in line with the previous month's survey's results at 21%. But a notable majority of 68% apparently have plans to maintain their staff numbers, while a further 11%, compared to 6% in December, say they will resort to staff cuts in the six-month period ahead. That's all we have for you this week. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for watching and stay safe.